world is full of hidden wonders. Sometimes, being able to see them is just a matter of looking at things from the right point of view. Consider, for instance, this mysterious painting and that strange white blob at the bottom. But if we walk around the painting and stand at just the right spot, the blob is transformed and reveals itself to be the image of a human skull. So this little bit of optical magic is called anamorphosis. It's from a Greek word that means to form again. The idea is that we start with an image or form which, as if by some sort of optical curse, has become distorted or deformed. But through a ritual of positioning our eye at a precise and possibly secret location, we can reform the image back to its original shape. These sorts of illusions start appearing in the early 1500s, pretty much as soon as the rules of perspective are discovered. But there's really no question that the most famous and definitely the most bizarre example of an anamorphic projection is this painting, The Ambassadors by Hans Holbein. Now, this episode's going to be extra special, because I'm going to present here, in this video, a totally new finding. Something that, if I'm correct, will finally answer a question about this painting that's gone unanswered for 500 years. And that is, I'm going to demonstrate precisely how the skull was painted, and from precisely where the skull is meant to be viewed. Okay, so I think this is all pretty exciting, so let's just jump right in. The first thing I did was to write a little computer program that simulates how the painting would look when viewed from any location. I did this using MATLAB, and that's also how I made the animations that you see. And I realized it would be mostly hopeless to try to give the technical details here, so I put a full explanation of all my steps on my website, idolsofthecave.com, which, of course, I encourage you to visit. Anyways, once I got the program working, I started playing around with various ways of looking at the painting. And one interpretation I read, which I really liked, was that the character on the left here, Jean de Donville, who was the French ambassador to England when he commissioned the painting, wanted it to be hung in a specific room in his chateau back in France. And this room had two doors, one at the back and one off to the right. So if you entered from the first doorway, you'd be looking at the painting head on. But the second doorway would place you, and maybe it would be a total surprise, at just the right position to confront the skull. And the skull here is a memento mori, a reminder that, regardless of our earthly attainments, death awaits us all. So I really liked this story, and because of it, I expected that the correct eye level for viewing the skull would be the same as for viewing the main portrait, since why should the viewer have to crouch or jump as he walked from one part of the room to the other? Well, it's easy to find eye level for the portrait. We can just look at the horizontal surfaces and see that it has to be somewhere in this band. Unfortunately though, it turns out this is all wrong. From this height, no matter what else you do, the skull's going to look, well, pretty lumpy. So, reluctantly, I had to abandon this premise, and after a period of trying lots of options, I finally accepted that you get the best-looking skulls when the eye is positioned about halfway up the painting. Now, there's nothing really significant halfway up the painting, except for the fact that it's halfway up. So, I ended up taking this as an assumption. That is, I'm assuming this is no accident, and that, in fact, the correct eye level for viewing the skull is at the exact vertical midpoint of the painting. Now, as far as making handsome skulls go, this is definitely progress. But more importantly, it's a vital clue in deciphering how the skull was drawn in the first place. Because it means we can eliminate the possibility that Holbein painted using some method of direct projection, say, for instance, by mapping out key points with strings. Instead, the fact that the best eye level for viewing the skull has no justification in the context of the painting's visual content, but a really good justification in terms of the painting's physical dimensions, indicates that Holbein almost certainly made the skull using some sort of grid transformation. In particular, one that maps squares into trapezoids. Now at this point, all I've managed to do is reach the same conclusion the National Gallery in London arrived at in their analysis of the painting. But we can go further than they do, because I believe we can reconstruct Holbein's trapezoid grid exactly. First off, we don't need to speculate about how these grids were made. You can find explicit instructions in several books from roughly the same time period, including one by our old friend Athanasius Kircher. And after staring at the transformation long enough, and comparing it to the painting, it's almost as if Holbein didn't even bother to hide the grid lines that he used. We already have the center line, which is eye level for viewing the skull. But there's another line too, and here I'm referring to the really striking and perfectly geometric line made by the skull's jawbone. If we trace this line out, it will intersect the center line at a point which, in Kircher's notation, is called S. And this is the first of two points we need to uniquely determine a trapezoid grid, the other being point O. The idea here is that points S and O would have been used by Holbein to make the anamorphic projection of the skull we see in the painting. Therefore, 
In order to get back to the original skull, all we need to do is locate point O and perform the inverse transformation. Now, using the jawline to fix S defines a family of transformations where the resulting skulls all have jawlines that are perfectly horizontal. But we still need another condition in order to pin down the location of point O. So I decided it would look nice if the resulting skull had an aspect ratio of 1. That is, it should just fit inside a perfect square. This assumption seems reasonable, and our end result is, if I may say so, a mighty fine looking cranium. But I kind of jumped out of my chair when I realized that this puts O in a spot that's actually meaningful. Because if we place the painting in a square 8x8 grid, then O will be located exactly 3 units to the right of the painting, and exactly 1 unit above the center line. And when I say exact, I mean exact. The agreement is to within less than a millimeter, which is certainly within the precision of my measurement errors. And it seems exceptionally unlikely that any of this could have happened just by chance. The fact that this result, which was entirely unexpected, falls out so nicely, suggests, I think, the entirely non-crazy possibility that maybe we really did stumble upon Holbein's actual technique for painting the skull. And if this is the case, then we have exact instructions for where to stand in order to see the skull properly. Because in the trapezoid transformation that we used, line SO represents the perpendicular distance away from the wall you're supposed to stand. And so, our grand final end result is that if you're ever in the National Gallery in London, and you want to see the correct skull in this painting, the skull that Holbein wanted you to see, you need to cover one eye and then look from halfway up the painting, 258 millimeters in front of the painting's surface, and 777 millimeters to the right of the painting's edge. But short of hopping on a plane to London, I still wanted some tangible experience, some physical token to show for all the effort we put in. So I decided a perfect addition to our Cabinet of Wonders would be to make an anamorphic projection of our Idols of the Cave emblem using precisely the same technique that Holbein used with the skull. So I made the image and printed it to scale so that it's exactly the same size and shape as the skull in Holbein's painting. And I fastened it to the door of the shed so that it would be easy to see from any angle. I cut some yardsticks to make a right angle of the correct lengths. And I also made a little shoe to hold it in place at the correct height. Then, if we stand at just the right spot in relation to the door, sure enough, we see our image restored back to its original form, just like the skull and the ambassadors would be if we stood at the identical spot in front of that painting. And it's amazing how watching the image deform and reform is to be reminded that wonder isn't limited to what's rare and exotic. Sometimes, it's just about looking at something old in a new way. Of course, as much fun as this has been, I realize that this little spectacle, and all our arguments from before, can't prove for certain how the skull in the ambassadors was painted. Although, I have to say, I think we've made a pretty persuasive case. I don't know if you're convinced, but at the very least, until next time, I hope this gave you something to wonder about.